I always just think of it as another toy. Somebody's handed me an amazing toy. If you hand a child a toy, generally speaking, I've noticed the first thing they do with it is not what it said on the box. And that's how I want people to see this. It's going to completely change the way we ask questions. So it's not, you know, when people go, oh, does it mean we won't need humans to do science anymore? No, it just means we'll do different things. We're now delighted to be joined by Professor Charlotte Dean. Thank you so much for being here, Charlotte. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to kick off by asking you a bit about your work and particularly the Open Bind initiative. Could you tell us a little bit about what that's trying to achieve, what you're doing? I work in the area of trying to use AI to improve drug discovery. It's kind of the, it's always my shorthand for trying to describe my research work. And Open Bind really springs from the idea that it's one of my favorite phrases. AI isn't magic. It doesn't just do stuff from nothing. It is a computational mathematical technique. And in order to make it good, you have to have data. And the concept of open bind is to, in the same way, we had the kind of revolution with AlphaFold because we had a database full of protein structures. We had things that we could use. They were there, you could build them, and you know, amazing science could be done. If we want to do the same thing to understand how small molecules bind to proteins in our body, and that's effectively what drugs are, we need that same kind of data. And so Open Mind is about collecting that data, but it's more than just collecting it by accident. So the PDB has been around a really long time, I think 50 years, and it's kind of almost an accident that we have the data set we need. The concept of Open Mind is collect that data not by accident, collect it with the people who do AI and machine learning involved so you can collect the right data, collect it rapidly, collect it to power the programs that will actually change the way you can do predictions of how molecules bind. That's a sort of, I hope, a quick summary of what it does. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess moving on from that, I guess, is this, I guess this is trying to rival maybe what exists in sort of pharmaceutical companies where they have latent databases of their own structures with their own drug molecules that aren't available to the public. Is this a, trying to rival that in some way? I think it's different from that as well. I mean, you're always going to have pharmaceutical companies going to work on the things that interest them. And obviously they are, if you like, honor bound, but also legally bound to make money. So they're going to hold on to that data because it's part of what they need to do what they need to do. But they always concentrate on, if you like, one molecule to take it to the end point. So you have lots and lots of data around a certain point. And that's really powerful in one way. But if you want to understand binding in a much more general sense, I don't actually want what's in the pharma. I mean, I'd love them to give it away, just to be <laughs> <Of> honest. <course. laughs> but what we really need is a much more general data set. You want coverage of the space. You want to try and identify what you don't know, where the models are failing, and generate data there which right now might not be useful for a particular molecule you're trying to take to market, but in the end makes a much better model. So it's about the diversity of the data and the types of data and what you collect. Yeah, a more generalized sense of what makes something bind to a particular pocket yeah. on a particular protein and what are the rules for that so we can predict them. Yeah, so thinking much, much more generally about the problem. And you can't all fun, and I guess this is one of the reasons why Open Bind can be set up like it is, as a kind of, you know, it's a public consortium, we're going to try and make all the data open, but have companies involved and sponsoring and as part of that. Because you can see it as a pre-competitive step for them. Yes, yes. Generate this data, it helps all of them. But for each of them, they're working on a specific molecule where they will probably generate data that, though I would love to see, I will never see, that will help them be really good at the drugs they're most interested in that they're trying to take to market in particular ways. If you pull out a little bit, it's an interesting conundrum all round, isn't it? Because you say quite rightly that AI is not a magic trick, not a magic box, and we need data, and we need large sets of uh, data. But then you were saying the, the people who make money out of this, it's not necessarily in their interest to generate the data sets. So how do, how do the data sets get generated more general if we need bigger data sets but there isn't a financial return for the data set? So I think this is that whole, there's always been this conundrum when you're working on problems that are close to the edge of what can be used commercially but it's also what public science is for. You know, um, I'll use AlphaFold as an example again because it's easy and because I've been thinking about it a lot recently. But no one company was ever going to create the data bank of protein structures. Right. But governments around the world have funded researchers to get protein structures. And they've done that 
because we all want better medicines. We all want a better understanding of our biology. We all think that that's really important. And also, if you put it to the other side, we all want companies that are successful, have economic growth, help make money for the country, as well as deliver brilliant medicines and do everything else. So it's kind of part of the bargain. And actually, to be fair to companies, they are putting quite a lot of money into these pre-competitive data sets, but no one company is going to do it on their own. So it's that mixture, I think. Right, but, but if you flip that on its head, you talk about governments. So what confidence have we got that governments around the world, as you put, are, are in this together? I think you're always going to have differences between what any individual government is trying to do. But science has become and really is a worldwide endeavour. You talk to scientists, we collaborate with people all over the planet. We are all funded in different ways by different mechanisms. But what we're doing is sharing, just like being here, with each other, what we're doing, how we're doing it, what makes us go forwards. So. I never quite think you know, it's dependent on a particular government of the day. It's dependent on, actually, if we're honest, the human race really likes learning new stuff. I mean, it does. We, we seem, you know, and it doesn't matter where that new stuff is. For me, it happens to be I love thinking about computational models. I find protein structures fascinating. I'm very happy there. But I also like learning new stuff about you know, how a computer works, but I like reading new books. And people like learning new stuff. And so there is this consensus of movement that keeps us doing this and at different points in time I suspect different parts of the world and different scientists will be the places where it's happening. I want to go more on to kind of innovation in the UK now we're obviously in Liverpool um, and particularly in AI and the UK is home to you know some of the brightest minds in the world particularly in AI research and computational biology I mean it was where DeepMind started but it's not where DeepMind is now necessarily I mean it's now part of Google so where do you think UK innovation in AI is heading and what work do we have to do to be able to compete with countries like the US and China? So the first thing to start with there is it's actually an amazing fact if you think we're not very good at thinking like this as the UK. We're not actually that big. Yep, all right. We think we're massive, but look at us on a map. We're quite small. And we don't actually have that many people. We have quite a lot, but we're not that huge. We are the third best country in the world at AI. Take your measures, take your metrics. Think about whether that's in terms of your spin outs, whether in terms of your, you know, the people we are training. That's incredible, right? Start there. And then also think whether the word is compete. The important thing to think about here is, I don't really like this term, but it's the easiest way to think about it, is strategic advantage. What is the UK uniquely placed to be good at? Where do we stand out? And you could argue one of those areas would be something I would pick would be around computational biology. We have an incredibly strong kind of pharma sector, biotech sector, as well as amazing biotech research going on and sort of biology research, as well as the computational research across our university landscape as well. But you keep think so you think about where we are good and what we are good at. And then you think how that adds to like the world landscape. What is the places? Because you know, we're not going to win at everything. And the scary thing there is nobody is. Yeah. And so that's not the way to think about it. And then the other part of this is to make the right partnerships, to work with the correct, the, the other countries which are excelling at the parts that maybe we're not excelling at, or the countries that also excel at what we excel at to go as fast as possible. So there's massive opportunities here. So spinning that the other way around then, what do you think we need to do to keep that strategic advantage? I have lots of opinions on this, and I have to be careful here because so I we, have... We, would, we were down the pub last night talking about this, would you believe? <laughs> I think about this a lot. One of the biggest things we need to do is keep training people. One of the biggest lacks in all of this is enough trained people who really understand what they're doing. And that's not just let's train loads of AI scientists. That's one thing, train people to actually understand the fundamental techniques of AI. But it's more than that. It's training all the people who do everything else to be able to talk AI. Can you, I mean, one of the ways I think about it is, could you imagine a scientist now who did any scientific discipline just going, well, I really can't add up. I find numbers really confusing. I mean, they might, but everyone would look at them and go, you're gonna have some issues there, yeah? 
And one of the ways to think about this is we are moving into a realm where people really need to understand AI. They don't need to be able to write it themselves, but they need to understand what it is, what it can do, how it works. And that is what allows you in a kind of AI for science world to make a really big difference. So, I mean, based on that point, if you were just kind of a general scientist today or a young scientist, where would be the starting point to understanding and using AI in the same way you know your mental arithmetic, your maths? Where, where would you start? So you start the same place you start with everything for learning, I think. There's go and read about it. Always just go and read stuff. We live in an amazing age where you can find lots of stuff to read. The second thing is go and immerse yourself in it somewhere. I was talking to someone actually over breakfast and we were talking about one of the things that's really important to do in science is to go and sit somewhere that's a bit uncomfortable for you. Go and sit through a talk you don't understand. Go and ask questions about that. Go and talk to people about it. Because it, for every discipline, there'll be different people who can help you to learn this. But there are people. So go and listen to them speak. Find out what they're saying about it. Find out what they're referencing. And that's the place to begin. Um, because actually, you know, it's just about learning. You can learn it. It's not impossible. It's there. And then going alongside that, it's the make yourself a bit uncomfortable. I do this all the time. And then the second one is don't be afraid. Yeah. I think in some ways we've turned AI into a scary thing. We've kind of made it, oh, it's really complicated. So you need to be really good at, and it's actually, no, it's not that scary. It is just a computational mathematical technique. It's amazing. You know, it does incredible things. But the basics of understanding whether it's working or not are the same basics that you should have learned as to whether any experiment is working or not. How do you test it? How do you train it? What's happening when you do this? Do you believe those results? Do they look weird? Yep. And all of those are the same. So I, for me, a lot of it is just trust yourself, don't be afraid, and go make yourself a bit uncomfortable to find out more. So when AI is sort of brought into the sort of everyday lives of scientists, um, I guess you're you're really kind of pointing out the fact that we'll still need to be present to intuit uh, because maybe AI won't be able to do that for us, to pick out, on, you know, to pull the threads uh, of a particular problem or to know or feel our way around a problem and know that something doesn't smell right or look right to us. I guess, I mean, I always have this phrase about what's happening with AI that people are not quite seeing it enough at the moment. AI is going to completely change the way we do science. And I don't think people have quite grasped that yet. You're still sort of seeing it as a bolt-on. It's going to not just change the speed we can do it at. It's going to change the way we do it. And I think most people have got that. They're going, well, we'll do it on a computer and then we'll check it with fewer experiments, that kind of thing. So the speed. It's going to change the questions you can ask. So it requires you to think about that. I mean, <laughs> some people don't like this, but I always just think of it as another toy. Somebody's handed me an amazing toy. And if you hand a child a toy, yeah, the f generally speaking, I've noticed, the first thing they do with it is not what it said on the box. That no, they that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I want people to see this. It's going to completely change the way we ask questions. So it's not, you know, when people go, oh, does this mean we won't need humans to do science anymore? No, it just means we'll do different things. And that's really exciting. But I agree, it's about, we're always going to have to think, well, is this actually answering the question I asked? Is it doing what I think it's doing? In the same way that we've got machines that run tons of experiments now, we always look at the output and go, hmm, yep, because we're trying to push the edge of what's possible. And every time you do that, you should always be looking at it with a little bit of suspicion. Well, Shah, thanks ever so much indeed for joining us. We really appreciate it. We'd love to having you here. And for me, I'm going to take I'm going to take one takeaway, if you don't mind, which is there's still a job for us because good questions are important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.